welcome back to the channel here for Sunday Highly on Update uh, after a week that has delivered a significant um, piece of uh, update on the company um, post Q2 that fell, uh, unfortunately, on a lot of deaf ears and, and created quite a churn in the community. Um, not so much for me. I was muted and I shared that reaction, hopefully put some folks at ease in keeping some context around a Q2 quarter that just was what it was um, during a time that if you were paying attention this week is on the precipice or a couple of months away from some amazing catalysts have a very uh, important charge to share my insights about what I picked up this week, what it could potentially mean. Um, and there was a couple of pieces of content, those who are bullish on the company and follow the company intimately, they're going to know um, uh, about the auto conference interview with JP Morgan, their analyst, uh, Mr. Peterson, who's just been really, really good. Uh, I've given proper accolades um, to to the coverage really um, for the uh, for really the past um, Q&A calls on um, their their calls. Uh, I think they've been fair, uh, but I, I found that some of the pointed questions that we got during that interview was uh, fantastic. Now, the Bloomberg uh, interview was on the fly. There was a few errors um, in the interview, one specifically naming the stock at an all-time high. I, I kind of chuckled a little bit at that because shortly after they showed the stock charts, which are ugly uh, at best, but I found them that to be actually the most interesting piece of content that was released this week uh, based on the answers that were provided by Thomas Healy, the CEO, on trajectory, insights, uh, timing, impacts of the business. A lot, lot to unpack here this week. Uh, I, I sometimes get a pretty natural excitement to do this project. Uh, I will share with you this week. Uh, has been a little bit different and that I kind of couldn't wait to release this. Um, there was a piece of content that was released this week. I want to give some proper kudos and actually apologize up front. I, I really haven't been providing uh, enough uh, kudos to Robert Bowie, uh, who is been providing highly on updates and doing a pretty darn good job of, 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 of kind of bringing the community together. Um, I often encourage people to take a, an independent view, uh, especially when it comes to finances and whether or not you watch Robert with a, investing in entrepreneurship. It's a channel that I highly endorse. Uh, Robert, I've come to know through YouTube, never met him in person, uh, but I do feel like I know the guy because he's pretty transparent. He, kind of wears his heart on his sleeve during the videos. Uh, that is a compliment, by the way. Um, and he, he probably came out with what I've considered to be a, one of his best pieces, if not his best pieces of content here as of late. Um, just passed over a thousand subscribers. So congrats to Robert and his efforts. And um, I will continually beat the drum on uh, pointing out those uh, patrons and the community um, that are making some fantastic contributions. Second will be Helion, who actually posted to Twitter the cleaned up version of the Bloomberg interview. Helion has done a great job of taking specific pieces and milestones of content and 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 really repurposing them to um, to to his audience through social media. So um, it was a piece of content that you know Robert had initially thrown on Twitter based on you know just just catching it on TV and then filming it with his iPhone um which was fine for me because I I wanted to see the content it was it was fantastic so if, if you did not catch both of those pieces of content and and then of course if you if you wanted to support that message I encourage you to kick over um I generate some pretty good churn on on the the Highland content and rightfully so I charged myself with a, an enormous amount of responsibility to try to convey what it is that I feel is at this point very contrary to a stock price at an all-time low um, and a company that is on the precipice of breaking into the industry in, in, a, in a way that is going to be um, fun to watch. It's going to be fun to evolve with. 
Um, it is going to be a long and winding road. So again, for you guys that get caught up in the short term here in 2023, there are foreseeable catalysts. There are foreseeable potential milestones to be met with this company. Multiple catalysts, I might add. Thomas Healy alluded to those catalysts when asked about the potential for financing and the opportunity to maybe raise that financing in a little bit better stock position, get a lot more bang for their buck out of a potential capital raised through the issuance of stock, which I think is probably uh, a foregone conclusion. However, I would encourage you not to look at that as a negative thing, um, rather a, a necessary thing to continue along uh, building out their portfolio of product offerings into the future. Now, if they were forced to raise, as Thomas talked about, like the rest of the industry, which I found like was really, um, really insightful uh, to be shared. It put a little bit more color on the Q2 call, which, you know, met a lot of investors and 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 and, and people who follow the story with some adversity um, in the, you know, painting a picture uh, in the EV space viewed upon as fairly negative in this time. And it it has just evolved over the last couple of years. Um, and it has probably evolved for the worse when it comes to having an environment that is conducive to Hylion. I, I look at it in a little bit, di bit different light. Uh, in other words, I, I can take this environment right now. Hylion is not poised to benefit from a, a momentous shift into electrification. This could be the greatest gift that we've ever been provided in that, you know, what if the industry was quickly adopting uh, right now and Hylion still wasn't prepared to benefit from that uh, paradigm shift in the industry that I continually talk about. I believe that paradigm shift to be inevitable, i.e. the shift to electrification um, I believe that there is still fleet interest, but I believe based on what Thomas Healy talked about, the difference now, as opposed to two years ago, two years ago was euphoria, um, throwing money at electrification without really any type of expectation of any type of payoff. Now, um, fleets are making um, cash conscious decisions, to quote the uh, uh, phrase of Thomas Healy, and I think um, appropriately deemed now um, in response to where fleets are and making decisions in um, a situation where financing has um, over doubled. So the cost of financing the very mechanism by which fleets take ownership of trucks to put into class eight rigor has, has, has doubled. Uh, and so to be cost conscious on those decisions are just the environment that we are in right now, coupled with, probably the most expensive ERX that we will see uh, in the current time with the potential of actually decreasing um, those cost of components right now, cost of input right now with low volume purchases of parts only drive up um, the, the cost of what we're looking at now. So the 40,000 of IRS credit that the Hylian has awarded for their ERX is is just a small drop in the bucket when asking uh, fleets out there to incur um, those higher costs of input. Now, Thomas Ely again spoke to fleets being willing to make those upfront investments as long as they can have some assurance of a uh, a total ROI over the co course of owning that product. And Thomas Healy doubled down on the Bloomberg interview to talk about a three-year ROI. If we're talking about an eventual product through the Hypertruck that can return a three per, uh, a three-year ROI, uh, we are we are in the driver's seat. And if, uh, there's going to be again people who tune into my message and they listen to my words about talking about the prospects of of you know where the company is going and. It, it always gets drawn to the magnet of the stock price, right? Rightfully so, to an extent. Um, we are currently in an environment where the stock price is recessed to an all-time low. I look at the company, and I believe that the prospects 
as they sit right now um, for making waves over the coming months and years is as high as they've ever been. And that is irrespective of Carno, which if you go back to 2020, when this company turned public, 100% of investors, 100% were not made privy to the potential of Carno at that time of making decisions to invest in this company. And now in 2023, you have the opportunity to invest in this company with that knowledge, okay, at a stock price far less than the decisions that were being made uh, as um, Hybrid EX and ERX was the uh, governing suite of the products in their product portfolio. The Carno SKU did not exist. And that vertical, since coming known, has fallen on deaf ears. The stock price has gone down, not directly based on that. It just is what it is. However, when we look at this objectively, and you can make decisions about investing in stationary power generation, as well as the potential that uh, Carno has to generate power on board um, their, their class eight vehicles. There was color added to um, the um, hydrogen fuel cell project with highs on the uh, unit is built. It is running and it is running on the test track. So when you look at a portfolio here, that is pretty well defined. Um, I'm not going to suggest that Hylion doesn't have any more secrets up their sleeve. However, this product portfolio is worth investing in. I, I will say it again. This technology and their moat, as described um, on the uh, auto conference interview with JP Morgan, is their moat surrounding their technology um, proprietary technology owned, um, and, um, has exclusive rights, uh, from Hylion, which is where their value comes from. I think, well, I've heard some criticisms about bolt on products and, you know, taking a bunch of nuts and bolts and throwing them into a basket and shaking them up and, 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 and dumping it out. And you've got the hyper truck ERX. Thomas Healy said something that caught my attention on the interview talking about a go-to-market strategy that's similar to Tesla. Um, I make no um, comparison whatsoever between Hylion and Tesla outside of the fact that their go-to-market strategy is similar to that of a Tesla um, and eerily um, incurring some of the same preliminary challenges that Tesla did probably in more difficult markets is Hylion uh, than Tesla. Um, but to start to get to market and then start to uh, in-house source some of those or even produce some of those uh, components that go into the truck in more of kind of a lateral shift, not to OEM status, uh, rather an in-house provider of everything that is powertrain. I think that will be an interesting shift for Hylion as time does evolve um, and and they become a little bit more uh, established with their financial footing. But for the you guys that um, monitor the story uh, over the week, I, I I would hope that you had the same reaction as me. I was encouraged. Um, I, I'm in a place now mentally a cut above the the consensus on the social media. Um, I know there was some shout outs uh, as well. This week, I, I apologize if I don't get to everybody, but Excalibur appreciated his response as well, admitted to me or or even in the video or or in a comment on one of my videos that um, you know, there was a little motivation for for him to to produce that content. And I I I'm in debt for that. Um his opinions carry weight with the community. Um as far as I'm concerned, he should be a recognized um, advocate for the company. Um, not to suggest even by his own admission that he's right or wrong. He's a lot like me and that, look, here's here's the way I see it. Um, I could be dead wrong, but here's how I see it. And, and I think those uh, vast opinions uh, across the board are super productive for 
um, the community as a whole. And I just want to thank Excalibur for his efforts, um, continued efforts from Andreas Rutowskis, as well as um, Silent Alert this week, um, doubling down on some of the statistics. Um, I, I gave the Jewel tweet of the week, so I give myself a little bit of kudos to make sure that uh, Thomas Healy, who talked about, I, I believe, a 200 kilowatt Carno generator, um, it is would be what would be necessary to run the Austin plant. Well, I said, okay, well, put your money where your mouth is, save these current utility bills that uh, go against CapEx, and we'll compare those two. Uh, over a 12-month basis once we have the ability to install Carno and power the Austin plant. What a fantastic way to showcase your product to suggest that they're running the entire company on um, low uh, uh, on-site generated electricity at seven cents per kilowatt. Yeah, so pretty pretty cool initiatives there. Had a little fun with it. Whether or not that'll happen or not, you know, I don't I don't know. It was just a a fun comment to suggest that if they're going into production of stationary power next year, would it not make sense that if it's good enough to sell to somebody else, that it's good enough to put into rigor for themselves? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, a few highlights from the calls of Glean, and, and really the big takeaway from this week is to understand that those pieces of content are out there and to make sure that you're self-educating yourself up as an independent investor on those pieces of content, but I'm going to go through my laundry list of notes as I did review the content again, both of them this morning for a second time to make sure that I didn't miss anything. There was a lot said. I highly endorse both pieces of content. Me personally, I kind of edged to the Bloomberg because I thought Thomas was really, really well-spoken. He was on point. I didn't think the interviewees did a very good job. Um, I, I really didn't. I, th I didn't think that the lady or the gentleman that was interviewing him um, had a whole heck of a lot of knowledge about Hylion. Um, But, you know, Thomas uh, really carried the interview, did a, did a wonderful job with the responses. But just a few highlights here. Um, deliveries of stationary power in 2024. Hmm. I would contend a, a dollar 24 per share. It's worth investing in that proposition. I did. Um, I bought 3,500 more shares uh, this this week, and I have more money to deploy if the stock continues to go down. Um, the only thing that Robert said that I would just caution you on, um, he's got some puts at a dollar, and that's the way to play it. But as far as picking uh, targets of, of 80 cents or 75 cents, I, I, be careful doing that. If you want to accumulate shares here at this price point, do it. Don't don't think that you're going to catch the bottom. Uh, invest in the companies for the right reasons. Um, and catching a low in the stock is not the right reason to invest in a company through the stock price. Okay, that's a bit of education for you in moving into this. In in other words, if you're if you're if you're looking to enter into the company at the all time low. At a dollar or eighty cents, with the idea that you're going to somehow exit the position at a dollar twenty, dollar fifty, two, four, five, then you're kind of missing the psychology of investing and and the philosophy that I have in that my share bases that I'm accumulating now are 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 multi year positions. Period. Um, anything less than that is uncivilized. Okay. So this vertical that we did not know about in 2020, we are now Prevy 2, and it, it has quickly come to market. Bill Peterson talked to Car to Thomas Healy and actually made the comment, and I it resonated with me, and it was something that I thought when Carno was purchased that Carno was purchased for very little money in respect to its potential. Now you you take on the 3D printing machines and you take on the IP and the and the technology from a company that is going through divestiture. Um, you would expect to get a, a good deal on it. At the same token, you wouldn't expect to be turning out revenue a couple of short years after acquiring that technology. And whatever revenue they can produce from this. 
There has been nary a discussion about potential margins or potential profit for Hylion or the business model on how they're going to um, drive revenues on stationary power. But to 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 be in a in talks now as early as 2024 to start to establish stationary power uh, as early as next year after after having acquired the technology a few short years ago is magnificent now this is a value proposition that i'm telling you is there um, you look at the stock and people are going to be like, yeah, right. It's a prove it story, Ryan. It's, it's not, there's no value. There's no value. It's no value. Um, I look at it uh, the way I always look at it much more diplomatically um, through the lens of an investor that got a bonus vertical without even knowing it uh, when I was initially starting to build positions. Now these new positions, trust me, are in um in respect to carno and not um you know uh, my old positions obviously were established without the knowledge of carno existing um however those existing positions are fortified now with the knowledge and the prospects that i think do surround carno um, and the opportunity it was the first time on the bloomberg interview where thomas uh in 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 what i picked up on and i don't know if you picked on up at at it as well um, broke the holding companies into two verticals. Do you notice that? Um, starting with two um, total addressable markets, two TAMs for um, Class A space, which has been legacy highly on, as well as what he deemed to be a larger addressable market for stationary power. What? Said it once, I picked up on it, thought it was phenomenal doubled down on that with the discussion with Bill as well. Um, talking about the um, the opportunity through stationary power um, to, um, to, to glean revenues on both of those specific verticals. But I, I think the real takeaway for uh, for investors is to understand the opportunity in each of those verticals and understanding Hylion's um, right at the very, very beginning of of uncovering the potential in each of those um, in a small capacity, okay? Um, but I would suggest investing in the company right now through a stock price that has never been so attractive. I commented on Robert's video and I said, look, with regard to the stock price where it is now, it's it's a very simple application. It's not hard. I think a lot of people are driving their decisions based on that acute uh, three-digit figure. And I, I just, I think that's wrong. Uh, people will make their own decisions um, irrespective of what I say and what I look to uh, to coach people through um, the, 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 what is being viewed as mental anguish within the Hylion community. Um because I'm stuck in a, a bit of a quandary in that I look at the company and I get a small grin on the side of my face. Um, I know the company is going to be at 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 and north. I, I know it's eventually going to be there. Um, if I know that now, then where does that put me when it does meet those milestones to come on and, and jump up and down and start saying, I told you so. I'm telling you now. Um, I'm already telling you now. Okay. So, when that happens, you will get the same approach, uh, conservative, responsible, um, diplomatic in reporting out on where I think the prospects at those times will be for the company in what they have uh, uh, accomplished up to those milestones and beyond. Um I think there's a lot of people, it's it's amazing who operate on that very, very shallow premises. See, I told you that the stock was going down here. I just entered 15,000 shares. Wonderful. I, I, I really hope you can take my, um, my insight in challenging you uh, to be a share owner over the long term. Double your position, people are going to look at 15,000 bucks and they're going to be like, damn, I'm out. This is incredible. Thank you, Ryan. You're the man. I'll subscribe to your channel. Um, I'm a lifelong subscriber. And all, all the while whisper out of the side of my mouth to suggest that you just left potential for hundreds of thousands of dollars on the table. 
That's how to handle the stock. Stock is down. The further it goes down, the better buy it becomes, assuming that the bullish conviction is there. Um, you know, if you buy this company and you're 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 bearish on the company, or you don't buy it because you're bearish and the stock goes to zero, you would have been right. Okay, this is business. This is stock ownership. All right, where I see um, a, a landscape and a community of people consistently taking sides, right? Um, I, and a lot of people are wishy-washy. They go back and forth. You know, I'm I'm, I'm super bearish. I'm, I'm super bullish. They go back and forth, and all the while, really, my consistent charge on this is to hold or not to hold. That is the question. Just make sure that your focus on owning the stock is on the company and not the stock itself. Right? Very, very dangerous to be making your decisions based on stack, stock action day to day, uh, or or specifically even making your decisions or awarding criteria, whether it be negative or positive, based on historical stock performance. That's even more dangerous. Like somehow because it's gone down, it can't go down further. Very dangerous. Um, the stock is down. So therefore it's a buy because it's going to go up next week, next month. Okay. I don't control the stock price. I've never continued to, uh, control the stock price. Um, I, I, I will just continue to say that I am a stock owner in the company. Um, I will declare my overall shares in the company when it's prudent to do so. But for you guys that are keeping score, um, you guys can understand that uh, my share position is continuing to grow in the company um, and my cost of basis is continuing to, uh, to decrease over time. Uh, and those installments that I'm getting now in a company that is sitting on um, such an incredible opportunity in, in each of their respective verticals um, is, is a position that I'm absolutely comfortable with, with making, especially in in light of a stock market that I own S and P, um, I own single stock, um, I own all those assets, and I monitor those assets just the same same as I do my speculative investings. And I can tell you, it's not like I'm just so excited to be a passive investor in the S and P 500, and so angry with my investment in Hylion. I look at the landscape right now, and it appears to me overall, from a macro, macro perspective, to be challenged. So do I have fair expectations overall? Um, do I expect Hylion in the acute to just somehow just start outperforming when I don't think that the macro environment, especially with when it comes to the micro gap space, um, is conducive for that type of activity? In, in other words, the micro cap movement is not moving up as a whole. It's moving down as a whole. Right, things have been re-racked and recalibrated within the microcap space over the last couple of years. It is not an environment of complete euphoria that it was during the SPAC craze. Right, when Hylion was able to de-SPAC their 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 initiative, um, they are now where they are. Three years removed of that, and is still shaking off the funk of that. In my opinion, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it is a prove it story. Um, and uh, Neri, I, I suggest to a subscriber base that tunes in to me that those catalysts are um, just a few short months away. Um, it's worth waiting and seeing. It's certainly worth waiting and seeing for the would-be share owners of the company who see it my way, um, in that I'm not looking at that as being the end-all, be-all. I look at it as being the beginning. You think it's been hard over the last three years? Try holding as, as long as me. I am absolutely steadfast with my decision to hold long term if this company gets up to what i would consider to be a fair valuation let's get to ten dollars the original stack spac value associated with the company now the company is going to be significantly different where provided value on its 700 million dollars of cash that it came to markets with and now having a different environment and having reduced in, in its stock price and market capitalization as a company, um, it, it's going to be, it's going to earn that $10 back based on its ability to 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 churn capital and, and to drive top end revenue uh, and eventually be earmarked for the potential of future profits.
That's going to be the new value of the company. And the first milestone is $10 to achieve that initial valuation when it came to public markets at $10, right? Um, at $10, I'm back in the black. Um, I think that's a, a, a reasonable goal. Um, I, I think here now where the stock price sits, I, I think eventually it will happen. Whether or not that's a year, a two years, three years down the line is irrelevant to me. It's fun to set those milestones around where I think the stock is going to go. Um, but that is the first milestone. Now, do I sell at $10? That to me will be just the beginning. And I'm hoping to report out on specific catalysts going forward as to the grow out and the build out of this company. Um, because we are still pre-commercial, all right. We we haven't even entered into commercial state. Uh, however, Thomas Healy said that we are um, starting the fleet trials within the next couple of weeks. Um, he alluded when being uh, being when talked about the the financing topic a little bit. I've talked about a few catalysts being on the horizon. I don't know if you guys picked up on that. So why take financing now? They're going to be opportunistic about this. In other words, if they announce some catalysts, some fleet trials are going good. And um, for whatever dumb reason in the stock market, the, the stock goes to six, eight bucks, they will raise. Um, I don't care if that's a month from now, two months from now, three, it doesn't matter. They have the opportunity, they will raise, okay? The reason why they won't raise now is number one, they don't need to, as admitted by the CEO. Number two, and this is conjecture on my part, so please take this with a grain of salt, the reason number two is because of the stock price, okay? And and I think any educated soul that follows stock market investing can certainly understand um, that they need to borrow a little bit more in a position of strength rather than a position of weakness. And they are in a position of weakness now. Um, and, and, and those um, remaining SPAC dollars at $350 million, um, will and could potentially be the most valuable dollars that ever existed um, in in this young company's life um, as a lifeline or to be fair, a bridge towards something more material into the future where the company can be a little bit more sustaining in their initiatives. Um, the the, the fi financial uh, position of the company at 350 million does really set them apart. The management's expectation is to use that capital wisely. Um, that was also disclosed. To separate highly on from the rest of the industry, where by goodness Thomas Healy talked about Lordstown, I didn't, I don't cover it enough to understand that Lordstown was one of those that went um, to, that went bankrupt. Um, um, uh, another uh, was a Proterra, I believe, was one of them, and another company as well. Just within the last couple of weeks or or months, or just as of late, uh, and the rest of the industry scrambling for for debt financing. Um, Hylian is not in that position. Um, I think it's great. I think it puts them in the driver's seat to potentially um, wag them out into the future uh, where potentially some of these headwinds that they have in the industry can settle out a little bit, get a little bit more positive favor, get a little bit of of, of institutional buying on the company. Um, if nothing else, these, these stock prices should be attracting buyers if the opportunity is as good as I suggest that it is. Um, some internal buying uh, would probably be nice, albeit not really one of those things that I put a whole lot of value on at this point, because I think that I, I, I think if, look, if I was an upper management, I would say, look, I already own my shares. I know the company is going to be doing well. Um, it, it may be perceived a red flag that they are buying here at the, at the bottom, right? Um, and, and perhaps maybe shed uh, a little bit more of a darker light on those, um, those purchases. I think it would be a bullish sign for the company. However, I, I, you know, I kind of look at it from Thomas's perspective and maybe he looks at it and says, you know what, I, I, I'm, I, I already own X number of shares. I'm good. I, I don't need to be bottom fishing my own company. That may look a little bit suspect if they do actually get a little bit um, of a north or northern trajectory on the stock. And, and I think he he would rather just avoid those negative optics of the company of, of going bargain fishing on his own company, um, maybe looked upon a little bit more negatively in that the stock has recessed. They're providing another opportunity for the, for the Hylion to bottom fish the company. Um, I will say that tongue in cheek by suggesting that that same opportunity exists for those uh, of us out there. 
right? Um, that have been following the company and it's publicly traded. You can do what you want. You can actively find shares on any of the major brokers. Um, uh, minus one that was reported to me that um, Hylian is not being offered on M1 Finance anymore. That was a new one to me, uh, but I've never had a problem acquiring uh, Hylian shares in the open marketplace. Um, the fleet's uh, shift on solutions uh, due to new challenges. I, I found this to be fascinating. It was an awesome insight to the industry as a whole. Um, looking at, you know, a couple of years ago where companies like Pepsi are just jumping on board with Tesla. There was an article that came out this week that deemed uh, the Tesla solution as the solution for long haul uh, class eight. Um, that is mis in misinformation. Um, Pepsi needs to be more careful with their information um, because that is false information. Um, the Tesla solution is not a long haul solution. So um, if you don't believe me and you look at the 500 miles of range, um, just look at the uh, performance that even some of the patrons of the Model S um, uh, Model 3 Tesla that uh, patrons are driving around that are rated at 300 and they're actually getting like 175. It's the same thing with semis. They're rated at 500 and they're going to end up getting half of that because of the 20 and 80 rule of the battery. Um, the, the downtime, I, I, I can't even go into all of the deficiencies with BEV. Um, I'm a small investor in Tesla. I'm okay to do that. Um, but outside of that, I don't buy the statistics that they put forward um, on their solution. And, and companies are much more aware they are going to be taking a second comb over of the industry and making those decisions not frivolously, but rather based in uh, statistics for those companies that truly do have a solution that fits their bottom line. Does Hylion meet that? I, I'm going to leave that to you. Um, I believe that they do, uh, but it's up to you to suggest that Hylion's not going to find their place um, in, the, in the space to deliver a solution that uh, drives that TCO and ROI over time. Um, Thomas mentioned the go-to-market strategy like Tesla. I found that to be an interesting takeaway in comparison. Good for you, Thomas. Um, you, you've actually given some light on the business plan and you know how they view Hylion as just a powertrain uh, provider and that the OEMs have done a great job. Thomas has said this before, and I think it's a great line that he uses all the time. The OEMs have proven over time that they're really good at building trucks. Why do we need to start now? I, I just think I, I said it in a little different way. That's how I would say it. A little more scathing. He's a little more, uh, you know, upper road with the comment, but he's right. Um, Peter Bilt and 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 Packar Freightliner, you know, all of the international Volvo, Penta, you know, all those OEMs, they've been making trucks this whole time. Why why change that? So the idea to integrate and really fortify what it is their focus is. I think speaks to their business lean model and and quite frankly speaks to why they are in the cash position that they are uh, even in the face of expanded timelines and an environment now where you know a 5% prime interest rate on financing cannot be good for the industry when they're looking at financing these products um willing to pay up front this was a takeaway that Thomas talked about with you know, a diesel truck at 200,000 and the Hypertruck ERX at 400,000. He continued on talking about a BEV being, you know, five to 550, hydrogen fuel cell being six to 650. Um, the latter solutions not even having infrastructure in place, 700 natural gas stations across the country, but then furthering that and doubling down on the fact that there's four BEV stations public and three hydrogen fuel stations total in the country. Cross-check me if I'm wrong. And the Nikola uh, bandwagon, they're going to come and throw stones at me and 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 they're going to say, no, Ryan, there's there's more, there's this many. And they, they make it up. Um, they pull it out of their backside. Yeah, these really, well, they don't, they don't exist. Okay. Um, check it out. Fact check me. Um, if there's 700 hydrogen fuel cell stations 
Um, they're still selling at over ten dollars a, 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 a diesel gallon equivalent. It's expensive. Um, electricity right now, the cost of electricity is on par with um, uh, diesel. So, what is the benefit? And I would suggest now in this environment that the green initiative and the anti-green, which was also talked about um, in the interview, the Bloomberg interview, really does create headwind in allowing fleets to really look at it and say, yeah, I mean, we're interested in electrifying the fleet for the good of the planet, but it has to make economic sense. So really cool. Reduced over cost with time and volume. So Thomas talked about the fleet's willingness to actually incur those upfront costs. And this is something that I actually believe to be true. Um, I believe that fleets can monetize that understanding that they're putting a, a tractor in, in play, that the more it runs, the quicker they can draw, drive ROI, right? Um, and compressed natural gas is the key. Renewable natural gas is the key to that end. Whether or not that's going to catch on, whether or not that's going to prove to be a, a true amongst the industry, and we see the hyper truck actually running on RNG on routes where it makes sense, we need to identify those routes that it makes sense on. Uh, fleets should already have that, um, where you know the shoe just fits for a hyper truck ERX. Other routes, perhaps the shoe doesn't fit. And this is something that Excalibur talked about on his video, talking about. You know, initially when we looked at the ERX, we imagined that the ERX was going to float around on a magic carpet hauling freight at max payload across this country um, for, for, for 1,300 miles a trip. And no matter what the route, it was going to fit. We, I've always contended that this was going to be a route-specific type of solution, always. Um, and where it fits, I think it's going to be great because I believe that those fits are going to be put into place and and get that return that we all expect through the statistics. In other words, I want Anheuser Busch to come back and say, "Look, we put it in this route; it makes perfect sense. The highly on solution is going to be that solution for that route." A little presumptuous on my part, but that's what it's going to take to move the needle on this project anyway. So why not forecast that those specific route uh, identifications are going to happen over time? Okay. I talked about the uh, hydrogen fuel cell Hyzon uh, project is actually up and running on the test track. So we'll expect to see more color on that. So very cool stuff. I thought the biggest takeaway, and I'll start to round down the video, guys. I know these long videos are sometimes a little bit arduous for people to sit through. Split them up in chunks if that's what you need to do, because I find that it's probably the most prudent uh, way to have an open discussion on Hylion. Um, at this point, I, I think it's super important to just kind of discuss and summarize what's happening week to week. Um, and I'm fascinated by the story. But the most interesting question by Bill Peterson was, what does this company look like in five to 10 years? Okay. This is what Thomas said. Be a tier one supplier. This is it. And guys, if... Highly on holdings can be a tier one supplier to Peterbilt. If you don't know what a tier one supplier is, Google it. I had an idea about what it is and I Googled it and I educated myself up on how important that could be. This is their goal. Your bet at this point at a dollar or $9, or $14, or $28, or $38, or $58 hinges around Thailand's ability to become a tier one supplier uh, to Peterbilt. I'll let that sink in. At some point in Thailand's history, we, we valued this company based on its ability to do just that. If they cannot become a tier one supplier, um, right now they're sourcing the trucks, they're buying the trucks, um, outfitting the trucks, sending them back to Peterbilt, extremely inefficient, not the way we want to see uh, longstanding. In the short term, it works fine because we're looking at such low volume production, it works, it's fine. They'll take a loss in the initial orders, right? Super important to understand that. Hylion gets deemed a tier one supplier 
and they can focus their renewed efforts on what they do, get a little bit of recovery in the stock, which is necessary, my friends. We all can all agree it's necessary to get a little bit of recovery so that Hylion can be provided a little bit of um, lateral movement uh, in way of their uh, financing options. We, we are talking about a whole different opportunity and it kind of sheds a little bit of light on the way I look at the stock price right now being more of an opportunity than a detriment. That's what the man said. Um, that's not my, what I'm saying. That's what that's what he said. Where do you see highly on in five to 10 years? We see ourselves as a tier one supplier of electrified powertrain solutions. That in, in, its, in its essence is the elevator pitch for Hylion. Your bet at this point at $1.23 is contingent upon their ability to see that end and, and realize themselves as a tier one supplier. It's that simple. Okay. Now, the second is a, a, a skew that I challenge each and every one of you guys to put yourselves in this 100% category of people who did not know that stationary power was even an option for Hylion when they first announced the Carno acquisition. As a standalone initiative going forward, the Carno technology is a good enough reason to look at this company as an opportunity, not a detriment at $1.23. Standalone. Irrespective of what they do with Class 8. Oh, Ryan, the product's going away. I disagree. Oh, Ryan, the Hypertruck ERXs are going to turn into dust. I disagree. Oh, Ryan, they're going to shut down the doors in Austin and close up shop and they're going to fire everybody. I just disagree. Oh, Ryan, the Carno technology doesn't work. I disagree. Oh, Ryan, the Hypertruck ERX doesn't work. It's not good technology. Oh, Ryan, Thomas Healy is not a good CEO. I, I just disagree. I just disagree. And we look at the vertical of the stationary generator power, and we look at what that could mean for the company as short as 2024 as they start to introduce this. One thing I want to add that Thomas Healy talked about is something that I talked about first. He obviously knew it, but he didn't share it. And it's funny because he used the same generator name that I did in Generac and thinking about it in a different way of providing primary power, not secondary power and how people justify paying. What's a Generac now, guys? 25, 3,000, 1,500? I, I don't know, depending on the kilowatt that you buy. But, you know, he said, you know, people are, are they're, they're justifying those purchases for the three or so times that it goes out and 20 hours of runtime per year. Because when it does go go power go out, it's it's a real detriment, right? To keep the refrigerator on so you can save the steaks and the fish, right? But he talked about the idea of the um, Carno technology liking to run, being very low maintenance. Uh, I, I saw this in one of my tweets this week out of the very few that I made this week where I want one. Um, I want to build in the country. I would love to have a Carno generator that had the ability not not only to provide 110 power, but to also charge my 24 volt batter, batteries that drive my pumps for my pool. Dude, the opportunity here, guys, by his admission, is larger than the class eight opportunity. Larger addressable market. My vision for the company specifically is that they make good on their promises on both verticals. I do not want to see the Carnot technology be one of those things that they put all their efforts in and then kind of divest from um, the Class 8 initiative. Because I will mention that the other uh, vertical that they talked about in where he envisions the company in five to 10 years is the Carno technology uh, being able to run the hyper uh, truck ERX. And, and I would like to see all three verticals survive, hydrogen fuel cell, Carno, as well as uh, RNG, because I think if Hylion abandons that, it's going to be a real disappointment for me, even in the face of positive uh, return on stationary power. I, I, I really want to see them follow through. Um, you know, I, I would like to see a reinvigoration reinvigor through 
um, secondary means of the hybrid EX. Um, I, you know, there's some in the community that don't like the product. It's really unfortunate that uh, Thomas does not even name the hybrid EX in their product uh, portfolio. Um, and I think in these lean times, the hybrid EX has proved to be a supplementer to um, the revenues now, which are 100% uh, driven by um, the hybrid EX1. Right. And I think in hilly terrain, I think it may actually have a secondary windfall of interest once Hylion becomes, becomes a little bit more of a household name. Um, the cash burn we've talked about, my friends, um, we talk about, and I'll, I'll wrap up the video with this. I think some of the key statistics on um, where the company will be in five to 10 years uh, is enough to look at this company with a different lens at $1.23. Um, I'm not telling you to buy. Um, I'm telling you I bought. Um, I'm not telling you to buy. I'm telling you I bought. Um, because for me, anything less than 10 bucks, which is where I think we'll eventually go on our first uh, stock position milestone, uh, is inevitable. Um, and for me, buying the stock at what I consider to be a 90% discount to that end just makes fundamental sense, sense to me, right? Um, you're crazy. You're misguided. You're caught up in this Hylion thing. No, I'm not. This is just where I feel like the soft spot in the market is. So I'm pressing on it. If we get this thing up to $10, $15, I may digress on my Hylion content. I'll go back to fundamental investing, which is what I know, love, and quite frankly, is what has made me, you know, uh, put me on this trajectory to a millionaire, uh, self-made. I might suggest I had no help, none, none. But right now, this press on this particular market, which I think has met some real resistance via headwind, um, is affecting and recessing the stock prices, not to our demise, but rather to our opportunity. It's just the way I feel about it, guys. That's my weekly summary. I hope you guys agree. If you disagree, leave your comments. If you agree, leave your comments. Uh, I would encourage you to check out the sources that I named at the top of the, the video. Um, check out those um, pieces of content that drove this content this week off of Bloomberg, as well as the auto conference uh, sponsored by JP Morgan. And uh, the interview was placed by um, by Bill Peterson. It was fantastic. Interview, check out those as well as some of the few sources that are putting highly on content out there. On a pretty consistent basis, I will continue to do my fair share in providing those fair acknowledgements to those content creators, because it's, I think it's important to continue to um, uh, to to foot stomp this message and and really help share um, this message. I'm on a new trajectory in sharing this because I think my um, conveyance of the message based on my real feeling about the prospects of this company, I've never felt so steadfast now. Um, and I find it ironic in the face of where the, the stock is currently resting uh, in what I feel like is one of the greatest opportunities that exist right now in the market. There will be better times um, and you're not going to be able to go back in time and regenerate this. Hey, Ryan, uh, you know, I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have done that. Well, that I wish it time is right now. Guys, thank you so much for tuning into the content and we'll catch you next week. 